Thank you for joining me in this final episode of the Temple Series. In parts one and two, we looked at ancient temples. In this final episode, we will see the big picture of God's plan for us. We will look at the temples that followed uh, Solomon's temple. Uh, we'll discuss the new covenant with Israel, how Christ enacted the covenant, and also what temples should be to us now. Once we see the big picture of the history of temples, we will understand who we are, what the Lord expects from us, and what we can expect in the future as it relates to temples and our spiritual lives. In episode one of the temple series, we saw that the tabernacle of Moses was set up just like the Garden of Eden. The Holy of Holies in the center of the tabernacle was just like the Tree of Life in the garden. In order for a person to enter that sacred space, they needed to be sanctified and holy. If they were not sanctified and holy, they would be kicked out or destroyed. The tabernacle was symbolic of this required purity needed to dwell with God. The tabernacle also showed us the future in which a spotless lamb, Jesus, would die for mankind and make a way possible to dwell with him even after mankind had been removed from his presence due to sin. An eternal sacrifice had to be paid, and God, in the form of Jesus, was the only one capable of that sacrifice. We also saw that the tabernacle was filled with God's Holy Spirit, and the evidence of His presence was seen in fire and a cloud that rested over the Holy of Holies day and night while they wandered in the wilderness. In the Temple Series Part 2, we looked at the Temple of Solomon and that it was a uh, permanent structure built in Jerusalem for the Lord to dwell. David planned it and Solomon built it for God to honor him and act as a symbol for the world that Israel's God was the one true God. Once the Ark of the Covenant was placed within the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple, God entered in and all of Israel could see the pillar of fire that came down out of heaven to consume the sacrifice. Again, this temple was symbolic of Jesus and his coming kingdom on earth. So what happened afterwards? Were there more temples? Do we need temples today? Stay with me on this journey and we will discover these answers together. In 587 BC, as prophesied by Lehi, Solomon's temple was destroyed and the kingdom of Judah, or the southern kingdom, was taken into captivity in Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar II. The Ark of the Covenant also disappeared during this time. It is unclear whether the Ark was hidden somewhere before the siege by the priests, or if Babylon took the Ark when they destroyed the temple. But regardless, it never appeared again after this date. Israel remained in bondage to Babylon, and during this time Babylon was invaded and conquered by the Persian Empire in 539 BC. King Cyrus the Great of Persia was much more tolerant of the Israelites than the Babylonians. The exiled Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem in 537 BC. A member of the royal family of Judah, Zerubbabel, who was the grandson of King Jehoiachin of, of Judah, was placed as governor over Jerusalem. He was a descendant of King David and the 18th grandfather of Jesus through Mary's line. So with the authorization from Persia, he led a group of 42,360 Judeans back to Jerusalem to live. Among this group was a Levite named Joshua. He was a descendant of the former high priests that had worked in the temple before the exile. Since Israel was now allowed to return to Jerusalem, and they had a descendant of the high priests, they were able, according to Jewish law, to reconstruct the temple and begin performing ordinances again. In fact, King Cyrus also allowed them to take some of the temple artifacts back to Jerusalem to put in the temple. The only missing element was the Ark of the Covenant. The other missing element to the temple building process was God had not told them to rebuild the temple. They simply longed for their traditional heritage in performing the rituals of their religion and these religions needed a temple. So now that they were back in Jerusalem and, and they had what they needed to keep the law of Moses, they immediately began construction of the next temple. The temple of Zerubbabel took 20 years to, to construct and had all the elements of the temple of Solomon. 
However, it was not anything like the original in terms of splendor and beauty. The people of Judah had been in exile, and, and most of Jerusalem was poor. They did not have the means nor the manpower to build such a magnificent structure as, as Solomon's temple. Ezra 3 records that many of the elders mourned once it was finished, and even during its dedication. Ezra 3, starting in verse 10, says, And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparels with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord, after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the Lord of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off. So one item to note is this temple never had a pillar of fire rest upon it as previous temples had had. It was not approved by the Lord, and He did not dwell there. It simply became an idol to Israel. Men were focused on ordinances, traditions, and the law, but failed to understand their spiritual significance. They failed to come up on the mountain with their God once again. The temple of Zerubbabel, whose construction began in 516 B.C., stood for nearly 400 years, and then in 19 BC, King Herod the Great began a massive remodeling project. This was the same Herod that killed all the boys in Israel that were two years and younger to try to eliminate the the Messiah uh, and any threat to his rule. King Herod's temple project was massive. He employed a thousand priests as masons and carpenters. He expanded all dimensions of the temple and the temple mount. For example, The original Temple Mount occupied 17 acres, and Herod's new expanded mount occupied 36 acres. The actual temple itself was finished in 10 BC, which was nine years later. The construction of the surrounding buildings, however, would last until AD 63. The temple now had similar majesty to that of Solomon's temple, but did not have the Spirit of God within it. Most theologians believe that King Herod was motivated by politics rather than spiritual reasons to improve the temple. A confirmation of this fact is there were no reports that the fire of God came down from heaven and His Holy Spirit did not dwell in the Holy of Holies. It was simply a magnificent structure made by man, but not for God's glory. The temple of Herod was destroyed in AD 70 by the Romans due to a zealot uprising amongst the Jews. Titus who later became the emperor of Rome, was the conqueror of Jerusalem at that time. Uh, He returned to Rome after his conquest and paraded through the streets with several of the temple artifacts that had only been previously seen by the high priest. Uh, Of these artifacts uh, included was the menorah and also the table of showbread. Uh, He also brought 700 Jewish prisoners back to Rome with them to uh, show off their power. One of the zealot leaders uh, that had led the rebellion was actually taken to the top of the hill on the temple of Jupiter and thrown off of it to his death as a symbol of Roman dominance. This conquest of the Romans caused many Jews to abandon their faith. Some joined various versions of paganism, but a large number sided with the growing uh, religion of Christianity. So this leads us to the New Covenant. The prophet Jeremiah gave a prophecy in, in, found in Jeremiah 31 in which he said there would be a new covenant with Israel. So, so starting in verse 31, we'll read, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. So he's telling us here that he had a a covenant with the people of Egypt, uh, in the land of Egypt, but they broke that covenant even though he was faithful to the covenant. But now he's going to make a new covenant, and here's the new covenant. After those days, saith the Lord, 
I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. So if you remember that old covenant that, that he had with the Israelites during Moses' time, they were told in Exodus 19, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And so this was the covenant that God had made with them. But now it was a new covenant. The law was going to be written on their hearts. So it wasn't just a matter of keeping the law. It was, it was a matter of having the, the law inside of them, in their hearts. So Israel had failed at keeping that covenant. They had turned to sin and to idolatry at every turn. God had come among them in power in the tabernacle of Moses and also in the temple of Solomon. But Israel simply did not know who their God was, nor how much he loved them. So Jeremiah tells us that there would be a new covenant. He said the law would not be written on stone tablets stored in a golden box, but instead it would be written in their hearts. Under this new covenant, they would live the law because of his love within them and not because of their fear of him. There would be symbolic rituals. There wouldn't be symbolic rituals and ordinances, but, but rather spiritual fruit and personal communion with their God. Mosiah also prophesied of this new covenant that would come. He saw a new kind of tabernacle in which man would commune with God. He said in Mosiah, starting in verse 97 of chapter 1, For behold, the time cometh and is not far distant, that with power the Lord omnipotent who reigneth, which was and is from all eternity to all eternity, shall come down from heaven among the children of men, and shall dwell in a tabernacle of clay." And shall go forth amongst men, working mighty miracles, such as healing the sick, raising the dead, causing the lame to walk, and, and the blind to receive their sight, and the deaf to hear, and curing all manner of diseases. And he shall cast out devils, or the evil spirits, which dwelleth in the hearts of the children of men. And lo, he shall suffer temptations, and pain of body, hunger, thirst, and fatigue, even more than man can suffer, except it be unto death. For behold, blood cometh from every pore, so great shall be his anguish for the wickedness and the abominations of his people. And he shall be called Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and of earth, the creator of all things from the beginning, and his mother shall be called Mary. So Jesus was the actual fulfillment of all the temples from the past. He was the reality that was symbolized by all of the ordinances, rituals, and sacrifices. His death and resurrection was the perfect, eternal sacrifice that would pay the price of sin. So in episode 1, we explained that a temple is a place where heaven and earth overlap. Jesus was a perfect human being, and he was occupied by the spirit of our perfect God. This made Jesus the perfect temple. He is the embodiment of God in human form that allows man to enter back into the Garden of Eden. Jesus was uh, even trying to tell his people that he was the temple, and that though the, f the temple of his flesh would be destroyed, in three days he would raise it back up again. He talked about this in John chapter 2. Starting in verse 18, it says, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. The temple at Jerusalem had been under construction since 19 BC, and so it was still under construction when Jesus was there ministering to the people and making this statement that he was the temple. They just could not understand how he could claim that he could rebuild it in three days. They were only thinking temporally. They were thinking of the temple in which they were standing and not the temple that was standing before them. They expected their Messiah to be a conquering king and not a humble, loving servant. They did not understand the nature of who their God was. 
uh, because they worshiped the laws that were given to them instead of using those laws to draw nearer to him. So Christ was crucified as the spotless lamb that would take away the sins of the world. As he hung upon the cross, he cried out to God and then died. Something amazing happened after his, he passed. We we'll read in uh, Matthew 27 and verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. So the veil of the temple was this thick fabric curtain that was placed over the entrance to the Holy of Holies in the temple. It had two golden cherubims sewn into it as a representation of the cherubim that guarded the Garden of Eden, preventing man from coming into the garden and partaking of the tree of life while in their sinful state. So now after Christ's death, the symbolic veil that kept man from entering the Holy of Holies was now torn from the top to the bottom and stood wide open for all who would make the covenant with him. This was symbolic of us now being able to go into the Lord's presence, just like going back into the Garden of Eden, because Jesus had sanctified us and had made a way possible for us to come back to him. This is really huge. The Holy of Holies was not open to the whole world in ancient times. The only, only person that could go in the Holy of Holies in ancient times was the high priest. He's the only one authorized by God to enter in that place and only one time per year. Now, because of God's sacrifice, all are invited in every day of the year. So if the veil was torn and God is now available to all, is there currently a need for temples? Do we need a high priest anymore to perform sacrifices on our behalf? So let's find out. The answers to these questions are clearly laid out for us in the New Testament and in the Book of Mormon. Once Jesus was risen to the Father following his death and resurrection, he told the apostles that he would leave his spirit to be with them. In fact, it was, with, it was to be left with all men and women that would receive the Holy Spirit, not just his disciples. This amazing day of Pentecost that occurred uh, was a time when Christ had already left and the people were all gathered together in a home. It was just a regular home. It wasn't the, wasn't the uh, temple. And there was men and women, about 120 people, were gathered into a house. And so it says that, uh, I'll, read, I'll read Acts chapter 2 and, and where it talks about this. And it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a, might, a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So do you notice what God did here? Each person in this house was filled with the Holy Ghost, and fire rested upon each head as evidence that the Lord was there. Remember the pillar of fire that rested over the tabernacle of Moses? And, the, and also the fire that came down out of heaven to consume the sacrifice at the temple of Solomon? So now we have individual people in this random house with small pillars of fire over each of their heads. God was showing His people that His Holy Spirit was now able to live within them. They no longer needed to go to the temple to perform sacrifices and commune with Him. He was now inside of them, and they were now the temple of the Lord. They were the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah where God said, After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. The apostles clearly understood this principle once that spirit was within them. Uh, Stephen, who was one of the first disciples uh, um, in the New Testament church, he was the first disciple to die um, as a martyr. He said in Acts chapter 7, starting in verse 44, and, and, and before I read this, I want to explain. So he was, he was preaching to the people, and there was Pharisees there listening, and he was explaining about this, this principle of the temple, 
what it is and, and you know what it should be today. And this is the very thing that got him killed. He was stoned right after this. So it says, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers, unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him an house. Howbeit the, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? And so he's explaining to them that you know, God came into the tabernacle of Moses and he came into, the, into Solomon's house, but that's not where he dwells. He doesn't dwell in temples that are made with hands. He, and now, especially after the new covenant, he dwells in the temple of, of our hearts. So he continues on, and, he, and this is where he, this is what probably got him stoned. He said, Ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your father did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now, of whom ye have been now, the betrayers and murderers. So interestingly enough, one of the people that was standing in that group stoning uh, Stephen was was Saul, who later became Apostle Paul. And after his conversion, he um, he preached multiple sermons regarding this this idea of temples. So in First Corinthians three, um, he was preaching to the Corinthians. He says. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And then in 2 Corinthians, he also said a similar thing. He said, And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. He was quoting Jeremiah's prophecy right there, showing that that's what Jeremiah was talking about. That we, that one day, um, the mankind would become the temple of the Holy Spirit once that covenant had been made and, and that sacrifice had been made by, by God. And so, they also, we also have evidence that they knew of this new covenant in the new world. Um, and so when Jesus appeared in the, to the people in America in the Book of Mormon, this is what he said. He said, in starting in verse 44 of 3 Nephi 4 in the RLDS, says, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I created the heavens and the earth and all things that in them is. I was with the Father from the beginning. I am in the Father and the Father in me. And in me hath the Father glorified his name. I came into my own, and my own received me not. And the scriptures concerning my coming are fulfilled. And as many as have received me, to them have I given to become the sons of God. And even so will I to as many as shall believe on my name. For behold, by me redemption cometh, and in me is the law of Moses fulfilled. I am the light and life of the world. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, right here is where he tells them that they no longer are under the law of Moses. The, the, um, the law was fulfilled in him, and he even tells them that it's no longer necessary to, to shed blood through sacrifice. And it's in, in verse 49 it says, And ye shall offer up unto me no more the shedding of blood. Yea, your sacrifices and your burnt offerings shall be done away, for I will accept none of your sacrifices and your burnt offerings. And ye shall offer for a, for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and contrite spirit. And whoso cometh unto me with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, him will I baptize with fire and with the Holy Ghost. So this took the place of animal sacrifice. Jesus paid that ultimate sacrifice. And now the only sacrifice that God is asking from us is that we have a sacrifice of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And so I'll continue. He says, Even as the Lamanites, because of their faith in me at the time of their conversion, were baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost, and they knew it not. 
Behold, I have come unto the world to bring redemption unto the world, to save the world from sin. Therefore, whoso repenteth and cometh unto me as a little child, him will I receive, for of such is the kingdom of God. Behold, for such have I laid down my life and have taken it up again. Therefore, repent and come unto me, ye ends of the earth, and be saved. So Jesus was clearly explaining to the people of America that the price had been paid in full. All scriptures concerning Jesus' coming had been fulfilled. He said the law of Moses is now completed in him. Uh, And he even specifically told them that they no longer need to offer up sacrifices of blood because his blood had atoned for their sins. This was actually one of the primary purposes of the tabernacle and the temple was to perform these sacrifices. And now they're no longer needed because the temple is now within us and the ultimate sacrifice has already been paid through Jesus. Uh, In fact, Jesus even explained it deeper when he told them that the only sacrifice they needed was a broken heart and contrary spirit. So each of us must have a contrary spirit, which means to have remorse and to be repentant of our sins. And then the broken heart is referring to us taming our natural man. We must be broken like a wild horse is broken into submission. We must offer ourselves willingly to God, recognizing that we are sinners, begging for His forgiveness, and then humbly walking after Him. This is the only requirement for us in the New, in the new Covenant. The New Covenant is completely centered around love. We must learn to love better. Jesus went on to explain in Ether who He is. Um, and this is, uh, this is later on in the Book of Mormon towards the end. But in Ether, he explained who he is and that the new veil in the temple, the only veil in the temple, is our own unbelief. So the veil of, in the, in the uh, temple in Jerusalem was, was torn open, wide, standing wide open. And so now the only veil left is the veil of our, un, of our unbelief. So starting in Ether um, chapter 1, starting in 108, it says, For behold, I am the Father. I am the light and life and the truth of the world. Come unto me, O ye Gentiles, and I will show unto you the greater things, the knowledge which is hid up because of unbelief. Come unto me, O ye house of Israel, and it shall be made manifest unto you how great things the Father hath laid up for you from the foundation of the world, and it hath not come unto you because of unbelief. Behold, when ye shall rend that veil of unbelief, which doth cause you to remain in your awful state of wickedness and hardness of heart and blindness of mind, then shall the great and marvelous things which have been hid up from the foundation of the world from you. Yea, when when ye shall call upon the Father in my name with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, then shall ye know that the Father hath remembered the covenant which he made unto your fathers, O house of Israel. And of course, that, that covenant was that we would be his people, and he would be our God. And it says, And then shall my revelations which I have caused to be written by my servant John be unfolded in the eyes of all the people. Remember, when ye see these things, ye shall know that the time is at hand, that, ye, that, that they shall be made manifest in very deed. Therefore, when ye shall receive this record, ye may know that the work of the Father has commenced upon all the face of the earth. Therefore, repent, all ye ends of the earth, And come unto me, and believe in my gospel, and be baptized in my name. For he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And signs shall follow them that believe in my name. And blessed is he that is found faithful unto my name at the last day, for they shall be lifted up to dwell in the kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. So we were told in this scripture that more would be revealed by John. So what did John say about the temple in, in the New Jerusalem? So looking in Revelations, uh, starting in verse 2, it says, And I, John, saw the holy city, the New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold the tabernacle of God. Remember we were told in the Book of Mormon that the tabernacle, uh, it would be a tabernacle of clay. So it's, it's a human form. It's a, it's, a, you know, it's a human body. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. 
And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. So John tells us that there won't be a temple in the New Jerusalem. He says that God will be with man, and therefore a structure made with hands will not be needed. God will dwell in their hearts, and they will love each other in perfection. Once we understand who God is and who we are, we can see more clearly what temples are, were, and will be. We will finish by breaking down Revelations 22, 1-7. This, this passage is full of symbolism, and especially if you understand temples and covenants and, and some of the law, um, it just comes to life if you understand what it's saying. Um, it is the reality of the kingdom of heaven that God was pointing to through all the symbolism of the law and the temple. So let's break it down, starting in verse 1 of Revelations 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So remember the Garden of Eden. There were four. There were rivers that flowed out of the Garden of Eden. We're also told that Jesus is the fountain of life. So, And I'm just pointing out the imagery here, how it all ties in. Then in verse 2, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So we know the tree of life was in the garden. Um, the book of Revelations also tells us the tree of life is in paradise. So it's kind of interesting, if you look up the original meaning for the word paradise, you find that it actually means garden. Um, so it's actually, they're one and the same. Uh, also, the twelve fruits could very well symbolize the twelve tribes of Israel. We have a lot of that, of the symbolism of 12 in the temple. Um, for example, the 12 pieces of showbread, uh, those were representative of each of the tribes. And since it's talking about fruit, um, this would be the fruit of the labor of Jesus who died on the cross for our sins, and the fruit that he bore was redeeming his people. So moving to verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So uh, once again, no temple in the in the uh, in, Jeru- in the New Jerusalem. The throne of God and the Lamb will be there. They are the temple. Uh, verse four, and they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. So we are told that God will be written in our foreheads, and this was this was symbolized by a, in the Old Testament was symbolized by a golden plate that Aaron was to put on his forehead. Um, that said the said the words holiness to the Lord, and he had to wear that while he performed his ordinances in the temple. And so the name of God, the holiness of the Lord, was written upon his forehead as a symbol of what would be upon us, you know, within our minds and upon us in the, in the end in the New Jerusalem, that God's holiness will be upon us for all to see, and that the natural man will be dead. Then moving to verse five. There shall be no night there, and they shall need no candle, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So the new Jerusalem will not need physical light, such as the menorah needed in the temple. God will be the light. God's plan was always for man to be a kingdom of priests. If you read Exodus 19.6, uh, God wanted a whole entire kingdom of priests out of Israel. Um, he didn't want just a bunch of you know followers. He wanted a kingdom of priests that have a, a living, breathing relationship with their God. Um, he wants us to rule his creation in righteousness. Uh, when he set up Adam and Eve to rule the garden, he was he set them up to rule the garden, uh, but they chose to be disobedient to him. They chose to do it what they wanted to do. The New Jerusalem will be like the garden, except it'll be another chance for us to be that holy, righteous priest that God that um, will fulfill the measure of our creation. 
Then in verse 6 it says, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And so these, these verses here are clearly talking about the new Jerusalem, the, the return of Jesus, um, the, the what is a temple, um, that his name will be written on our foreheads. I mean, this is all really symbolic stuff that is all re- referencing back to temples. So really, at the end of the day, what God really wants is he wants us to be back with him in the garden. He paid the price himself for us and placed his spirit within us gave us his Holy Spirit to help guide us back to him. And he really just wants us to choose him. He wants us to take our place as priests in his kingdom. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit now, and this is our time to prepare our hearts to live with him in eternity. We must learn to truly be contrite and broken before him so he can use us. Our hearts must not be full of pride, and we must not be living according to the flesh with our own agendas. Once we fully understand that we are sacred ground, where the Holy Spirit dwells, and how deeply He loves us, we can begin to allow Him to work in us. There are are many religions today that are vigorously performing ordinances and rituals in temples, hoping their God will respond. Some religions are anxiously awaiting for the conditions to be right to build another temple. Some religions have temples placed all over the world thinking that their rituals will bring salvation to their members. But the truth is that Jesus did away with the need for temples made with hands. His temples are those that are willing to soften their hearts and embrace Him in love and be obedient to the promptings of His Spirit. If you're a member of a religion that requires a temple for worship or a temple for the Lord to return to uh, for his bride, I would ask you that you consider this video and go before the Lord in earnest prayer regarding this issue. This conclusion may come as a shock to many watching this presentation, but in order to truly see God, we must look at all he has done throughout history and take in the full tapestry of his message. He loves us. He loves us all so much, and he just wants to be with us. We we can't rely on our religion to explain God's plan, but rather read it yourself and pray for wisdom and be led by his spirit. He is calling you to be his holy temple. Will you soften your heart and allow him to enter into it? Will you allow him to come into the holy of holies? Will you humble yourself before him and become his people? Many have gone before us, giving giving their lives even to serve Him and to teach us who He is and what His plan is for us. I hope you will be willing to let go of your traditions and religious understandings in favor of truly listening to His voice as He calls to you. God bless you as you diligently seek Him. Take care.